Today's episode is brought to you by Eagle Energy. Eagle Energy is a caffeine-based inhaler. It is replacing coffee and those high sugary caffeine drinks that take 30 to 45 minutes to kick in. Eagle Energy only takes 30 to 45 seconds to kick in. I love using it when I wake up first thing in the morning. It gives me a little jolt to the day. It focuses me on the task at hand and it assures that I stay focused and relentless on what I want to do. It doesn't make me lazy. It just makes me go balls to the wall. I honestly love this product. Make sure to go to their website, eagle.energy, and pick up your Eagle Energy today. I use it, obviously. My friends use it. My parents use it. Every time we have a new guest on the podcast, they're always trying it out. They absolutely love the product. It's just a matter of time before you purchase your first Eagle Energy. And once you do, I guarantee you will not be disappointed. All right, boys, we're going. Billy, welcome to uh, welcome to the podcast. It's been a long time coming. I know you've been wanting to come on. We've been wanting to have you on. And now you're here, so full full circle. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. And thanks for the coffee, by the yeah, way. No problem. Oh, Many times. Right. I'm uh, I'm still on this Eagle Energy tip, but nothing wrong with a little coffee every now and then. Yeah, you still like, need to pick me up here and there, right? You said you were cold. Coffee will warm you up. I'm freezing. Freezing. Fre- well, not you, but I'm always cold. No heat here. You have to pay extra. You got to save money somehow here. <laughs> it has been pretty cold the last couple of days, so I mean. It, what is it today? Minus oh, 13. With the I wind think. chill, it's got to be close to minus 30. With the windshield. With the windshield. <laughs> We're on the drive out to Boston. I thought it was hilarious that every patch of ice or every puddle we saw, we got <laughs> excited because it was frozen and there was a potential possibility of us being able to skate on it and i was like that's how you know you're canadian if you see a patch of ice or a lake you yeah, just go any bonkers. opportunity you just kind of take it where you where you can go with it right that's what i was gonna say it's freezing but you know what we did a little pond hockey tour for the last couple of days and i don't know what excites you guys but pond hockey season certainly excites me i know you guys had pretty good uh, response there to your uh, pictures and videos from playing pond hockey so i mean what's more canadian than that a couple, a of, whole uh, lot. couple of beers pond hockey a little Let bit of timmy's coffee there. or whatever Billy, I'm oh, worried about your mic. Just one sec here. All right. Okay, talking to it now? Yeah, am I good? I don't know. I guess so. I always figure it out after, but uh-huh. yeah, it should be good for now. Um, <laughs> I'm worried about your mic. I am. I'm always worried about the mic because we can't... Talking to it again? Yeah. Talk normal? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Right test, here. test. Middle. Test, middle. Yep. Everyone listening? Yeah, that's good. Perfect. Yeah, right good there. 90, hey? <laughs> well, see, oh, see, you're the bottom right there, so... Yeah. So that's perfect. It's like kind of high right there. Yeah, I got to yell, I guess. People that listen to the high button are well aware that we have microphone issues. So yeah, yeah every it's episode. Okay. Hey, it's a little adversity. Just battle through it. All you Story mean. of dudes is like, yeah. are you kidding me? Well, that's all you say. Every time something bad happens, you go, want to hear a story? Battle through adversity. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's the whole purpose of, of memories is you got to learn from them, man. I'm not saying I learned from all of them. And don't make the mistake again. Have you ever made a mistake twice, dudes? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah? What episode is this for me, dude? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I was just expecting you to say no and then give me a, a life lesson right after it. No, man. I'm, that's one. I'm, not, I'm a realist. <laughs> I have no problem sharing my issues, you know? You got a couple problems. All right. Yeah. That's uh, for sure. <laughs> trade, trade deadline. Happened yeah. yesterday. Did it? Two days ago. Did it? Time flies when Monday, you're having fun. Monday, buddy. Time Monday. flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Um, Time flies when you're an idiot. The biggest trade that I've liked over that, the biggest acquisition, Nashville, Simmons. I think they're going to win the cup now. You know what? That was a solid, solid pickup because, I mean, they're probably going to face the um, the Jets at some point in the playoffs and them picking up uh, Hayes there. Oh, my goodness. They're going to be solid. That's just more depth up the middle between Shifley, Hayes, um, uh, little like third, they're, they're so deep down the middle that I don't think any team's going to be really able to play with them come uh, come playoff time because playoffs is all about crashing and banging and hard nose hockey for two months straight. Especially on the West Coast, when we had Lowry on the podcast, that's what he talked about. He's like, I love playing on the West Coast because the West Coast Conference is my type of hockey, and that's what I that's my argument against what you're saying. Is it's too much crash and bang because by the time they go to the Eastern, well, the, the finals, whoever comes out of the West, they're exhausted. I'm not saying that the East Coast isn't crash and bang, but it's just a little bit. Yeah, more they're finesse. different. Different style of hockey for sure. Like, but you look at uh, you look at the Q versus the Dub. Like, see the exact same thing. You look at that. They have the guys coming out of the Dub. They're big crash and bang. And by the time they're done their playoffs, they come into the Mem Cup. You see a team like uh, like a skilled team like a couple of years ago, Rouen last year with Bathurst. You get guys that uh, that maybe haven't had it as physically as demanding as the the teams from out west, and that'll that'll break down over the the course 
course of a week during a, uh, a tournament like the Memorial Cup. I think we're past that era of hockey. <sighs> I, I know they're still crashing and banging and stuff, but like when you're talking the West Coast crashing and banging hockey, I visualize like like 1990s to early 2000s where like teams like Dallas and like who else would it have been? New Jersey would just dump the puck in and just run in behind D and just cr- actually crash and bang. You know what I mean? Now it's more of a puck possession, uh, special teams kind of game. Yeah, they're still crashing and banging. And yes, the playoffs will be much more intense for it. But I don't think necessarily each conference is going to be like kind of separated by their stamina. You know what I mean? I don't. I think it's going to be an equal grind on each side just because of today's game. But if you look at uh, if you look at big playoff series, like it, it's not the it's not the overall one game or one series of taking huge hits. It's the fact that you're playing four, three, four rounds of uh, yeah, of playoff hockey, little bumps here and there. That that takes a toll on you because not to mention being and injured and stuff going in, right? Like you big. still just played an 82 game season. And you're Some playing, people aren't just like. For a team like Tampa down the stretch, they're probably going to, like, rest their big dogs a little bit. You know what I mean? Whereas teams like, well, like, what, Colorado, even, like, there's a couple teams still in the wild card race, that, which most teams are these days, actually. But you got to actually grind all 82 games just to even get a sniff, you know? They always say rookies going into the NHL, that's the biggest adjustment. It's just the grind of an 82-game season. Like, you know when you're in junior and you're like, oh, the worst part of junior is coming home at 4 a.m. and you got to do this and that? It's the same thing in the NHL. You're still flying into Detroit after you have a game at Madison Square Garden the night before. You're still flying in You're still late. playing every second it's night, just too. That you're st- it's just that you're staying in a five-star hotel and you're getting a massage every single morning. That's the difference of the NHL, I think. And you're not driving the pink bus, like, per se, you know? That's the difference. Yeah. I, I've heard good things about the pink bus. I, heard, I know you shit on it a bit, but I hear good stories about it from other people. Maybe it's just because you're the only one standing. I know it was a good laugh. Absolutely, the other it's a good team laugh. Coming and you in. know what? I had a lot of good memories on the <laughs> bus, but like, <laughs> no, I don't know who was telling you good things. <laughs> well, probably the guys that were sitting down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just, we're not going back down that lane. I'll just get fired up. Um, other trades that you guys like, top of the head. Uh, so, no, you no. know what? I really like McQuaid to Columbus. He's such a solid D man. He's proven playoff performer, maritime a boy. maritime oh, boy, good up. PEI guy. You know, but I like and plus the uh, the moves they made up front. Like I mean, they're they're going for it at the end of the day. You look at Bobrovsky, solid in nets. Their D, Wierenski, like there. They picked up a bunch of guys, man. They're solid. Like they're a team to they're a team to watch out for. Come uh, come playoff to, time. Winnipeg was the biggest. Uh, the biggest like piece, I guess, in the trade deadline. I think all the people they picked up, like solid, solid. They did Winnipeg, a thing. Sorry, Winnipeg. Yeah, yeah they did, like a, they had this thing where they what they gave up and what they got in return. And man, another guy GM, I feel whew. for though is uh, Zuccarello. First oh. game with Dallas, man. Goal first shit. Like Locks one shot. of his first Did you shit. see uh, uh, Henrik Lundqvist? That the was interview. tough. Tough. It just goes to show you the amount of passion that some of these guys have. Like, some people will shit on them, like, oh, a bunch of millionaires playing a game just for fun. But no, man, these guys give a fuck. That's the true... That video was the true meaning behind teammates being family man think about when you're leaving a junior team after living with guys for two or three years and you don't see them again like that stuff's hard like i remember times in uh, like especially in yarmouth we had such a close group because when you're living in yarmouth <laughs> you got no one to help no one else to hang out with unless you go to high school and to trust left, me there high school wasn't the easiest uh, easiest spot to make friends but uh why wait wait whoa. why do you say that <laughs> oh well you know you're uh, you're a new kid coming in grade 12 grade 11 and uh, they see it, they see automatically as competition or a threat. Like for myself and a couple of the other guys, like we had girlfriends going down there, so we weren't competition to them. But they seen uh, other guys coming in from say either Halifax or Cape Breton, Newfoundland, that kind of stuff. They like to go and have fun, and uh, usually that means uh, taking away some of the talent from uh, from the locals. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though. Yeah, but that's a given. If you're like, man, it's like it's, here with the Mooseheads. Like my sister goes to PA and like. It's the same thing happens there. It doesn't matter where you go. It's junior hockey. You hear the boys talk about it on other podcasts about going out and having fun. It's, yeah. it's just the way it's the way of the road, I guess. Yeah, it's not our fault. Yeah. Oh, it's the hockey culture, man. The culture yeah. side of hockey is never going to change. But it's the same with co- like college football down in the States. The exact same thing. You see you see the guys walking around in the big high schools and then the big colleges. Like It's the exact same thing. It's, you you, know, you got to do those things, man. Yeah. Teams got to hang out outside of... Uh, Outside of the game, which is, was a point I'm going to backtrack to the Lundquist thing right quick. And um, see, now I lost my train of thought. 
Take your time. I know it was because of the whole Longquist crying, New York, Madison Square Garden. Oh, Zuccarello. Well, yeah, yeah. My point was people forget to realize that these players actually live lives outside of hockey. You know what I mean? Like, especially in New York. That's mm-hmm. exactly right. So when like there's they have families and stuff, and when your families, you know, start hanging out all the time, and then you you're together for ten years, like that's. I mean, think about if they have kids, they're best friends for 10 years, and then all of a sudden they separate. It's not just the hockey side of things, right? Like, yeah, it's easy to see, like, well, why is he crying on live TV? Like, you know? And that's one thing I think I especially, I think all three of us really never experienced was the professional side of hockey. 100%. It's a total, like, I remember talking to Nosy, he dabbled a bit in it, and he essentially just said the lifestyle outside of the game is what changes, really. It's you acting professional, it's, you mm-hmm. know, doing these little things that, are making sure that you know you're in the public eye so you have to act correctly and those are things that we never experienced so i couldn't imagine on the nhl level once you start making this money once you start you know having your kids go to school once you have a wife that becomes friends with all the other teammates mm-hmm. wives once you all that other shit that comes into play it's an actual job like it's an well, actual it yeah you still have to go home at the end of the day yeah. you know what i mean like yeah, yeah some nights are longer than others but you still it's no different obviously it's a lot more fun <laughs> yeah that's what you work for. But just seeing that, uh, that seeing him tear up in a regular season interview rather than a playoff, like after a loss, game seven, that's when you usually see that. True. And I, I don't think I've ever seen uh, an interview like that in the regular season where a teammate, you know, kind of tears up. So that was kind of cool to see from him. For sure. The king. It definitely hit people, like a lot of people in the heartstrings. You know, the hockey community, man. Yeah. It's, they go with whatever emotions rolling in the hockey world. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to you, Billy Yarmouth Jr., small city. I never played junior hockey uh, in a small city. When I played, it was here, and the, the Mooseheads essentially dominated the fan base. But I want to know what the fan base was like back in Yarmouth, like when you went out in public and trying to somewhat act professional, things like that. How, how did that go down? <laughs> you know what? Um, Yarmouth is one of those spots. I mean, you can only say great things about the town, about the, the organization, the, the people in the community. I mean, great fan base. Oh, Hated playing there, the, but great oh, fan and that was the thing. Like the when I was when I was playing there, my first year, they still had the puck banger. So they were basically <laughs> they would all line up behind the uh, behind the opposing team's net, and they would all have two pucks in their hands, and they would smash the pucks against the glass like, in warm up too. Keep like in, in mind, warm-up, this is right the beside the they, bench as well. Yeah, from the time they opened up the gates an hour before the game until the time the last whistle went. They were banging those pucks on the glass. I remember I first showed up and I was like, what am I getting myself into? Like, it, <laughs> it honestly felt like a scene out of a movie. Like, what are these people doing? But Fans you just realize at the end of the day, like, we were the show in town. Yarm is such a small spot. You're three hours away from Halifax. You're an hour away from Digby where there's not much going on. You're like, that's the thing. A lot of, a lot of fishermen down there. So it's, they have a lot of time off, especially um, just before, like in early on in the season. The fishing season doesn't start until the end of November. So oh, yeah. you have the first while to have uh, a lot of hockey to be seen. And then, I mean, when you walk around town, you have your jacket on. Even if you don't have your tracksuit jacket on, you're walking around town. People are waving at you, asking how it's going, if you need anything. Like, that was the thing. It wasn't Fuck, just... man. We were there four years later, and the guy was like, Billy! Yeah, the pizza you... place. I'm like, Jesus. I can't recognize you four years later? Yeah, oh, least. man. Like, that's the thing. You, like, I still get messages on Facebook. Like, it's great to see. It's just... Wow. It's such a community-based team, and they treat you so well, and... Uh, the first year I was in Yarmouth, we actually went to uh, the finals. We beat you guys uh, yeah, relax, in the first relax, round. Relax, yeah. relax, Sorry, bud. How were you guys even there? This is my podcast here. And, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, actually, I'm going to talk about that run for a bit because that was the like by far the highlight of my junior career. We, I, so I went and decided that hey, it was uh, it was the next step for me to go and play junior. I was drafted by Yarmouth. That wasn't wasn't touted to play junior A. Seventh just kind of yeah, just kind of went down and worked my uh, worked my ass off. Just wanted to be there, wanted to get better, and ended up making the team out of camp, which I was uh, pretty excited. So about. how old were you? Uh, I was seventeen. Didn't you had played? Did you play high school? Uh, I played high school my grade ten year. Uh, then my grade eleven year played subways. And grade 12 year, I stuck it out in junior A, played a little bit. So that's very about, similar to me. So yeah. you want to talk about, like, that's not even taking the stairs, man. It's taking the escalator up, yeah, you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, if you want to even dig a little further back, uh, first year Bantam, I mean, as a kid growing up from time novice to second year Pee Wee, I was probably one of the better kids around town. Like, I was traveling quite a bit. Actually, one of the uh, spring hockey teams that uh, Liam O'Brien and I played on, there was Anthony Mantha. There was uh, Andreas Anthony, see you. 
Oh yeah. Uh, like we were just stacked, dude. Like it, it was, it was incredible. Didn't you play with McKinnon for a bit? Yeah, we played like Nova Scotia selects together. He so he's in '95 and I'm in '94, and he would play up with us in the spring. So he would play with guys like Taylor Burke, myself. Like, what's he? What was he like? Man, he he was, he was he so show? good. Everyone everyone knew he was going to the show. Like Brad Crosley would come out and practice with us, and he would be like, he's like, this is the guy that you should be looking up to. And we we're all like, man, this guy is a year younger than us. Like, <laughs> but like, you, you could coach? you could just tell he had that natural gift. He had that natural ability. He, like his skating set him apart right from day one. Still does. Still does exactly. Like people, I would tell people early on, and <sighs> like when he was playing World Juniors, I would always argue with the guys from Quebec. They would always be like, oh, Drew Ann's the better player. Drew Ann's the better player. I was like. Dude, I've watched this kid grow up, man. He is going to be like, he's going to be the real deal. Next thing you know, he, Drew Ann lights up the world juniors and they're all like, oh, Drew Ann might be number one, might be number one. It's like, don't, man. It was the Seth Jones it. saga too, right? Exactly. Until and then, he lit him up four times. And <laughs> I remember what, it was in the Mem Cup when McKinnon blew by Seth Jones. And after that, I think it was Nick Kiprios that came on. Yeah. And he's like, he just solidified first overall after that drive. <laughs> just on that one. It was like, it, and it was funny. I remember that Mem Cup. That was a very interesting Mem Cup because the draft, because you know, every NHL draft here, there's a lock at number one. Oh yeah. That year? No, no, no. There were, no one knew. No. Until the end. Until the end. Yeah. And I remember what you just said about Until the Drew big stage, Ann. right? Exactly. Uh, Drew Ann, A lot of people thought he was a better junior player, which... I don't know. No, he was just more flashy. And that's he, it was, what that was see. just more his game. Yeah. Yeah. Junior, he, think of the guys he's playing against. But yeah. you look at Nate, though. He goes to the dirty areas all the time. He drives he's, wide and shit. Like, Druen's like, under the stick, through the feet. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm not saying he doesn't do the other things, but McKinnon's not going to get noticed as much mm -hmm. because he's just not, doesn't have as much flair. Yeah. And he's strong. He's, he's just like, he's deceiving though, which is part of his game. Like he's three strides. And then all of a sudden you're like, you got your gap, you got your gap. And then boom, he's gone to the net. And you're like, what just happened? He didn't even move. Yeah. Whereas Drew like all over the place, right? Yeah. Which is still hard to contain. Well, McKinnon is different. up and down. Drew is right, left. Even his side to side though, like McKinnon, he, like he was so fast. I, I remember playing against him in the queue and I was just like, honestly, what the hell am I doing on the ice against <laughs> this guy? Like I have no, I have no reason being out there. And it's funny actually, cause like, my my Q career lasted forty four games or something like it wasn't wasn't very impressive but uh, <laughs> better than most the one uh, the one uh, the one memory I do have and the only reason why it's a, a good memory of mine is because it's the only picture I have of me playing in an actual game <laughs> and it's a picture of Jonathan Drouin going by me on the half wall <laughs> and it is and and it, as sad as it is I didn't like I didn't play enough to get any pictures on the ice do you so have it framed or anything no I get him to <laughs> sign it it's somewhere yeah. but maybe one day down the line I'll uh, I'll get him to sign it but no it's pretty uh, pretty funny. That the only pitcher I have of like game action is against Jonathan. Dude, Jordan. what about the one on the bench? So you picking your nose? Yeah, actually, it was. Um, uh, it was my 18 year. We were <laughs> playing a game in. Uh, <laughs> we were playing a game in Cape Breton just before Christmas. It was a Friday night, like probably like the 23rd or something. And in the Friday queue, nights. you only get you only get like two or three days at home. So I was like chomping at the bit, getting ready to go home. I'm super excited to see fan or family and friends and all that kind of stuff. So we play the Friday night uh, before at home. So we had a legit full week off before Christmas. So we played monk, So like we had a full week off and then we played and then went home. So we had to sit around for a full week <laughs> after we played and then play the next Friday. So we were sitting around practicing for the whole whole week, play the Friday night. I'm in the lineup. I was like, all right, sweet. At least it'll game will go by a little quicker and all <laughs> that kind of stuff. So get on the bench. First period goes by. Maybe see two, three shifts. Second period, uh, maybe a shift, I think. And we were playing Moncton. Moncton was pretty good that year. They had like the Sonia twins yeah. and like they were, they had um, Dimitri Yaskin, yeah. uh, Barbashev. Oh, they Barbashev? Were, oh, yeah. Okay. They, were, yeah, yeah, yeah. they were solid that year. And then third period comes around. All my family and friends are at home watching the game, like excited to see me play. <laughs> They do a panorama of the uh, bench, so they go from one end to the other. Get to my spot. I'm right in the middle of the bench. I have, a, stick. I have my mouth guard in on my bottom mouth, like on my bottom teeth, like not even on my top teeth. I have my mouth guard on my bottom just teeth. Just like fucking just around. Just biting on it, not even paying attention, and my finger up my nose. Dead serious. On East Link TV and like Friday Night Hockey, I was like, oh yeah, here we go. I'm definitely sticking up here. <laughs> uh, the sad part is that's his most memorable picture. Man, so, and someone framed... Free, uh, He's framed it. Yeah. And like <laughs> literally put it, like literally was watching TV, <laughs> press pause, sent it to me and put it on like social media. I was like, ah, oh, here we go. Like, Amazing. Let oh, the yeah. roast begin. Right. Like we'll have to get it back up one day. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. So that was do a pretty, you, uh, do you still have it? Oh, I definitely still have it. Yeah. 
We lost it. A... No. There we go. There we go. Man, this studio is going to fall apart one day. That's a hilarious. That's a hilarious yeah, it was a, story. It was a pretty good one for sure. I mean, pretty memorable at, at least. Yeah, of course. We got sidetracked anyways because I want to. The, the main reason for me asking you about high school was to basically show anybody who was listening that no matter which route you take, you still have a chance. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're good enough, you'll get seen. So you went from being one of the top notch like younger minor hockey players which is like everybody there's always those guys right some then oh, my yeah, dad always player. said it was a funnel right like the tough guys make it through but you were small and then when you got to the higher levels you stayed small yeah no so when i so coming out of peewee super small kid like maybe five foot not even 100 pounds yet and went out and tried out for my band of triple a team I uh, got cut from band of triple a that was probably the biggest blow of my hockey career at that point because i Man, I played AAA all the way through. I had a couple hundred points in like Pee Wee. Like I was like I thought I was going to the NHL just on skill alone. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that there's other intangibles in your game that you have to work on and figure out. Like I didn't realize the the whole working out, the whole nutrition, the actual focus of the game that you gotta that you gotta do to get to that next level. Uh, so I went and tried out for the double. So I went and tried it for the double a team got cut from the double a team so i went from playing peewee triple a being one of the top players around down the shitter right down to banamay so went down to banamay and i was like you know what like i essentially i just said screw it i'm not even gonna really like i didn't really like hockey at that point i, so I decided you? oh i'd be livid so I then what I, I decided i was like you know what i'm gonna play defense and I'd just have some fun so i moved back to defense uh in banamay just oh, out of the blue just said, you know what, I'm going to just have some fun. Ended up, at, like, not really having much fun because <laughs> it wasn't, like, not saying that I didn't have fun, but, like, I was used to competitive hockey Absolutely. at that point. I wanted to be, like, the next level hockey player. And the kids that I was playing with just... They were out there having fun. Nothing wrong against, like nothing against Guys them missing or games and shit. Like exactly. And I was, and that just wasn't what I was used to at that point. So that kind of kicked me and like kind of gave me a kick in the ass to say, hey, if I want to, if I want to play band of AAA next year with all my buddies, and that was the tough part. Was going to Your school, buddies, yeah. was going to school the next day and seeing my buddies that are playing band of AAA and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you know what? Why the fuck aren't I there? And as as bad mm. as it sounds, I got I got jealous. I got envious of them, and I kind of used it as motivation. That's a normal feeling and, for you to have. After and that. just because growing up, I was always a really high skilled player. I knew that my skill was never going to be the issue. So if I just worked on the other things, then that would be what propelled me to the next level. And right. then the next year uh, I made Bantam triple a and as a all, forward or D uh, as a forward. So I right. moved back to forward and I was like, you know what? I'm going back. And we had a lot of returning guys because the band of triple a team the year before was a lot of first year kids. So I was showing up on a team with already six forwards. So they're top six and you only carry three lines in Bantam at that time. That's true. I didn't. I so yeah. you, so you only had nine forwards. Do they spots. carry four now? Uh, we carry, uh, so three I coach half. them, uh, Cole major Bantam team and we carry, um, 11 forwards. Okay. So back then you'd only carry nine and there was six spots already taken. So there's only three spots open and I was going for one of those spots and I just kind of went with it and worked, uh, worked my ass off in camp. Did you Made grow at all? Sorry. Did you grow at all? I grew a little bit. I, at that point I was maybe about five, two, five, three. Ooh, big yeah, man. big I You know what? But that, that's all it took me to get that confidence. Cause I, I could feel that in battles. Like True. I wasn't losing battles as easily and that kind Your of stuff. Your reach was different, that kind of stuff. It, yeah. And that kind of stuff. So, and then Bantam AAA second year, that's a big time because I remember there was guys, Locks my best buddies were having Brad Crosley and Steve Kroll and all those guys coming to your house, Kirk Collinson, coming to your house, talking to you about commitments. And it was all about the verbal commitment at the time where you would have your, have your coach come in and say, hey, you made the team and it's October, like get ready for next year yeah. kind of thing. And I remember there was a couple guys that, that were committed and I, that were my best buddies, played with them my whole life. And then that really made me realize that like, why isn't that me? Yeah. Like, and that was always been my mindset. Like you just can't, you can't just sit there and sulk. Cause at the end of the day, no one's going to feel sorry for you. You're not going to be able to, mm. um, you're not going to be able to battle through adversity. Like the same thing happens. You're late in a game. You're on the end of your shift. You're on a penalty kill. There's a loose puck on the wall. It's all about will at that point. Mm -hmm. No skill is going to get you. No skill is going to win you that battle. It's all about heart. It's all you about gotta find it. You got to find it in you and you just got to, and you just got to work for it. So, um, coming in so that year in band of triple a had a very good season thought i did uh, thought i did very well for an undersized guy didn't play a bunch but at that point my next next jump was major midget camp and i got 
absolutely manhandled. My first major midget camp, I went to the Subways camp, and they were they were a solid team. I mean, yeah. obviously, like solid franchise. Yeah, they're. I mean, they've had a few guys that have uh, gone a few. somewhere. What's so. his name? Sidney Crosley or something. Oh, he played there, uh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> Marchand is that a guy? <laughs> did he Marchand? play there too? I think so. Wicked awesome. Um, Shepard. Anyway, <laughs> we can we can continue that uh, another day. But uh, so I went to Subways camp and. That was really where it put hockey into perspective for me because I realized that I was not even close to playing at the major midget level. And just from the, the fact alone that like skill can only get you so far. Like you can have all the skill in the world. You look at uh, bigger guys like um, just like growing up, you see guys that aren't great skaters but have a ton of skill. They get weeded out. Their Absolutely. skating isn't great. That's just a skill that they that they don't have. Um for for a guy that's smaller if they're smaller they got to either be a water bug and be able to get out of those situations that they get themselves into Mm -hmm. or they got to be strong enough on this on their skates or smart enough as a player to not put themselves in that position Mm -hmm. so with that i realized that i didn't have that in my game yet so i got cut for major midget obviously that was a blow and at the time they didn't have this minor midget uh, league that they have now which is i think personally an incredible idea yeah which is a great development league for those kids it's almost like, a second i don't want to call it a second chance league but it's just like it gives you the confidence to be able to push forward right like you get cut from it and you're like well what do i do oh dude I, and there's so many people that get to that well that got to that point where they didn't make major midget and then the next step was either minor midget which was guys outside smoking before the game or <laughs> yeah. whatever yeah. Drunk for games. and that's and obviously being cut from a major midget team or high school and high school was obviously you're having fun with your buddies, but it's not like super serious, good hockey. But at that point you're not, a lot of guys don't actually take that next step from high school. Mm -hmm. So when you see someone that does make that jump from high school to major midget, that kind of shows that, Hey, you know what? This kid's committed and commitment like is one of the most important things when it you comes guys to both made the jump yeah from high school and there's a lot and there's junior. a lot of guys that have too like jared grant did the exact same thing yeah and he oh yeah jared put and high school. jared was and jared was one of those guys like kind of kind of behind the scenes that i that i looked up to because he played Dartmouth subways played high school that kind of thing and cool. that uh, just that kind of route so you could make that uh you can kind of make that uh, comparison hmm. so that made it a little easier to to kind of go through that situation where you yeah I wanted to touch on your first major midget camp because you're going in there 15, you're undersized in, in Bantam or whatever it is, right? Like some of these kids in these camps have like are either turning 18 or have already turned 18. I was going to say like the puberty And factor. you don't like, you don't realize that at a, as a 15-year-old, the difference between you and an 18-year-old. But when you're 18 playing against 15-year-olds, you'd notice it, right? Like some of these guys got beards already, bro. Like they're fully gone through puberty. They've hit their growth spurt already. Like these guys are almost men, you know, aside from like the mentality. Mm-hmm. These guys are like they're some some guys we played in in my first year were like six four like two fifty like what yeah. what are we gonna do? I remember <laughs> when it's a big difference. I hit puberty probably fourteen fifteen. I was at a summer camp at St Mary's playing against good players like you know AAA players and I don't know you dudes played with me when I was younger. I, I was you know I was afraid to get hit. I was a winger. I had a hard time getting the puck out. Yeah, off Walt's because he was wearing a right? Jofa. And <laughs> yeah, fuck off. <laughs> I'm trying to open up here, you just hit me while I'm fucking down. <laughs> Um, and I remember just being like, you know, intimidated by the bigger players. And then that just one year, you just kind of hit puberty. You grow. You're mm-hmm. like six foot. I was still a lanky kid, but I had the confidence to make a pass harder. I was confident to take that second look, be able to chip the puck over the guy coming my way. And it's funny that one summer just kind of changed my career in hockey. And mm-hmm. I feel a lot of people that make the jump like you and I have that one summer. Yeah. Have that one year that's just like wow, okay, I'm turning into a man here. But you know and what? Then that makes the difference. It was the uh, it was actually that's the uh, year after my grade ten year. So I played high school hockey for yeah. Dartmouth High, and let me tell you, we had a wicked time. But we won maybe two games all year. <laughs> like we were we were awful. We like we were no good. I was what playing. Year? I was playing top line minutes as a grade ten on a terrible team. So I mean that probably helped me a lot in development, just to, in the fact that I was playing a lot with older kids because high school hockey is a grade twelve league. Doesn't matter where you're going. 
one. So, I mean, Plus, you're playing a lot. at school now. You can tell in high school hockey. When we were at that tournament the other day, there was an Auburn versus CPA game on, I think. You can tell the players who care and don't. Oh, yeah. and Easily. And and the funny thing was, is I was playing uh, that year, actually, Brennan Sonia and I played against each other oh, yeah. in high school hockey. He yeah. was playing for Citadel at the time, which... Uh, he was tiny, which, too. Yeah, exactly. And we both had the, the kind of the same, uh, the same situation, mm-hmm. really skilled, just smaller guys, didn't really get that opportunity because at that point there was a lot of uh, a lot of size involved with uh, with decision making in uh, in hockey absolutely but, uh, no Sorry, it's been uh, but no it's been a like for i know for sans it's been a crazy ride for him like just coming back from sweden playing pro and all that kind of stuff obviously i didn't have uh, quite the extent of a career as yeah. he did but it just shows you that you don't have to play major midget your first year get drafted into the queue play in the queue go on play university play pro there's other routes that you can go to and get to that same spot like you can go play Mm -hmm. uh, especially in the media era oh it's crazy you can and that was one thing that i did want to touch on you can nowadays it's so easy to get access of game tape or film or anything like that and just sending it out to coaches you don't that's the thing you don't need someone to come knocking down your door to get a spot on a team you go to them if you go to them and send them a message send that shows initiative and if you're showing initiative that you want to be there that you want to be a part of a program you're gonna get looked at you're gonna get looked at just Mm -hmm. on the fact that you want to be there good point coaches love seeing that you want to be there there's nothing better like i know uh, myself coaching now when you see a kid that comes to practice every day and wants to get Get better and like how do you not put that kid on the ice yeah. and you that, find it's easy to tell oh uh, like you, just like uh, since you started coaching do you find it's like easy to not that you want to like pick them out but it's like tar- easy to tell like which guy comes and gives a shit and which guy doesn't not like you can you can tell for like sure. on every team you can you can always tell it doesn't matter if you're in work or if you're in school you can just tell by looking around a room um when something's going on like if uh, like if you're in a classroom and the teacher's talking and you look over in the corner and you see little Timmy on his phone and you see the other guy in the chatting and t- chatting and then another guy taking down notes like which kid do you feel more it's not that you feel more obligated to help but that kid's showing the initiative that he wants to be there he wants to get better so I mean he's just trying to better himself and you want to help people that want to better themselves because those are the people that you should want to sur- surround yourself by and now that you've started coaching I know, obviously, through your your line of career, you've been a, you've been a prick to your coach at some point, right? Do you find or do you think now, maybe you were a little bit hard on your coaches at some point over your career? Because I know I certainly do. Yeah, everyone has for sure. Yeah, that. But that's also to the coach trying to get the best out of at True. points because I know for me, I wasn't uh, like from to motivate me. An easy way to do it: call me out. Oh, you yeah. say that Same I can't here. do it. If you tell me I can't do something, oh man, I can't wait to prove you wrong. That's the best. One. That's it's just the mentality that people that people have. But then you also have the kids on the other side too that you say that to, and they'll just absolutely crumble. Yeah, mm. crumble. Like you're and, right, I can't. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and it's just like, well, then what's the point? Like you, you can't get babied through everything. Obviously, you have to read situations and react to situations differently. But I mean, at the end of the day, you got to be able to, like be able to take criticism doesn't matter if it's constructive or not i got a question for you yeah was there any point in your career when you were addressed for not maybe not giving a shit um off the ice yes for sure <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah same but <laughs> on the ice on the ice no i don't think um just just off the ice was mostly um and it wasn't even um like partying or boozing or going out it was putting in the the extra effort off the ice just through uh workouts yeah. stretches that kind of stuff like i know in in like the basically the dog days of winter basically from just after christmas to just before playoffs or just before christmas you're kind of in the rut where you're practicing every day playing on the weekends like you're doing the same thing over and over and over and again and you just get into like kind of like a rut and you get a little bit lazy and i found that I would always get lazy just before Christmas because you're at the point where you're just like, all right, <laughs> you get, see it. get me home. You're on that home stretch. You know what I mean? Mm. So I found that those were the times. But right after that, you just need a little a little break. You can find that like you'll see that even in the NHL, guys will take a couple games off or just okay. like who was it last year? Was it Vasilevsky that took took Dubit- a little Dubitsky bit? Off? did. Yeah. Like and it's and it's he got just, sent home on a Vegas trip. Yeah, that's a that's a tough look though. Vegas trip <laughs> sent home. home. Ooh, I don't know about that. But I mean, still getting paid five million a year. Yeah, you, I guess you can do whatever you want then. Yeah. But when you're playing junior and you're trying to trying to get to that next level, whether it be university, whether it be pro or or whatnot, you you got to kind of realize that hey, this is if you want to do this serious, you gotta you gotta commit to it. You gotta be all in. You gotta yeah. throw your chips on the table. That was one thing I learned the hard way too. I remember when we were up 
uh, or not we, when I was up with the Mooseheads for a little bit, Bobby Smith was coaching. And, you know, Bobby Smith, obviously, mm-hmm. first overall Montreal Canadiens, historic NHL career. Charles and we were actually in Cape Breton getting the, getting, we were fucking losing. <laughs> and, uh, and he comes in the room, he goes, let me make one thing clear. There's two types of people on this team. One, there's a type of people that want to make it to the NHL, go to university and have a great career. Two, there's people that are just here for the pussy. <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he says to us. <laughs> And he goes, and I know who's here for the pussy. <laughs> Next thing you know, trade deadlines, I think <laughs> two days, three days after that, half the team essentially got shaken yeah. up, gone. Yeah. <laughs> and it just like scared the living shit out of everyone. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. And not that it didn't happen in junior A, but there's definitely guys in junior A that are just there based on their skill and don't really care as well. So oh, if sure. someone gets shipped to Amherst, they're not, they don't care. They're still mm-hmm. playing hockey. They're just happy to be there. But when you're in the queue, it's a completely different yeah. mindset it's like okay if i can do well here i can go to the nhl and potentially well your make are just seven hundred thousand dollars a year yeah. and it's not only that you're if you play major juniors is just a stepping stone for all kinds of different pro pro hockeys yeah university all kinds it's a gateway for scholarships like all kinds of shit but that's the thing too you got you also got to think there's like especially when like when we went down to boston there you go down and you take a look at spots like harvard and bu like why would you not want to play there i, I don't understand yeah. like and unless you're a smack. nathan mckinnon or or uh, like any kind of top top round guy going into the queue, go play NCAA hockey. So anyone that's listening right now, the BU dressing room was an NHL caliber dressing room. We're talking hot tub. We're talking cold tub. We're talking tiled BU showers. We're talking gitch room. We're talking ping pong table. Ping pong table. Own we're gym. talking Turf lounge sled room. Tracks. We're talking anything and everything. And by the way, the stadium that they play in is. Well, almost class. NHL caliber mm-hmm. like stadium own private gym like they don't have to share their gym with the rest of the school no it's their own hockey gym I'm just like BU is obviously one of the top notch college teams but even the Harvard room like oh, shout incredible. out to Shane Bowers for getting us in there yeah, yeah well. Shane and Willie there like I'm so happy we went on that trip and saw that side of hockey because we're all used to junior hockey. None of us have really, maybe you guys went up and saw Wig play in Plymouth, but yeah. that was my first time ever being exposed to, to that type of hockey. But you know what? We don't Holy. get that exposure at all here, no. um, especially because of our piss, junior, keep talking. especially because of our junior <laughs> league that we have here. It's a lot of, you see it as like a graveyard for like Q guys and O guys. Not so much stuff. anymore though. Not anymore, but like when before. we played like my first year, if you went to junior A, you had no, like I was, I played in the era of if if you got drafted in the 14th round of the junior a draft you were the, like one of the top prospects for the queue do you know what i mean like they just took your rights because they they didn't have any more picks and if somebody gets sent down then they have their rights yeah. right which you've seen a ton of mm-hmm. you know what i mean guys going up some guys got sent home for not giving a shit some guys get sent home because they just couldn't compete yeah like but it, it also the one reason for the for the exposure thing i believe is you, for scouts, you go to Ontario, you go to a junior A game in Ontario, I would say 97% of those guys on the ice have a have their eligibility. So they, why would they come down to Nova Scotia to watch maybe four or five guys yeah. that have their eligibility to play? So that just doesn't make, make sense on a program um, in the States to, to send a scout to watch a game where there's only a couple uh, prospects, or they can go to a game in Ontario and drive within an hour over the weekend and see hundreds of prospects so right. and i'm not saying don't go to the queue it's not a good good route but for guys that maybe bloom a little later like you look yeah. at a guy like brennan sonye you like those yeah, he did the, the, he did it too he played ncaa and that's what i mean he played ncaa he went from even high school. wig went late and that's the th- and, and, and it doesn't you don't have to be this top prospect to go somewhere and do something everyone has their own road everyone has their own path you just gotta honestly you just gotta stick to to working hard on and off the ice working on your skills and being a good team player because when it comes down to it there's a ton of guys there's a ton of guys with a boatload of skill Mm -hmm. because you can you can take skills camps for days for days in Mm -hmm. the summertime you can be on the ice every day not me as natural but if you don't have a good if if you're not a good teammate you're not going to the next level because coaches don't want you on the team and if you're not a good teammate you're probably not winning and if you're not winning what's the point of having you it's funny we had matt anthony on here the newbridge coach and he said that when scouts call him it's not even about what kind of player is he it's what kind of guy is he well they know because they know what kind of player he is body language all that kind of stuff like the the like the things that you don't see um, in their skill and on their right, like when I think about ice. body language, I cringe about what I would have looked like Same. as a minor hockey player. Same. 
Like all those times my dad would tell me like, calm down, shut up and all this stuff. And then you're yelling back at him like, man, no wonder, you know? I remember once we were playing the subways in the game where the overtime game. The and I, I won or the triple overtime game? Triple overtime game, not in the end. Penny. Um, and I flinched at a guy. And I remember I went back in the car. Dad talked to me. He's, what are you doing flinching at someone? You're not tough. <laughs> Put the puck in the nest. What are you doing? You look like an idiot. You know, all the scouts were here. They saw that. They're going to, you know. Keep it in the toolbox. And then back in the yeah. day, you're just like, oh, whatever, dad. I don't care. But then, you know, you grow up. You're like, ah, that wasn't a good look. No. You think it's cringeworthy, stuff like that. Breaking Hindsight's always 2020, though. What's that? Hindsight. Um, always 2020. I liked how you said, especially if you're a late bloomer, consider NCAA options. Because um, most players are late bloomers. You know, you'll have those players that are early bloomers, but they're a rare, a rare breed. Mm-hmm. Most guys, you know, they start to if come into themselves 16, 17, 18 years old. And by then... You're two years into junior. Yeah. If you take those years off, go play somewhere else, then go play yeah. NCAA. My God. And that's the thing. Like you'd Wig. Wig became a better player at the age of 20. He, he was yeah. in his prime at 20. Well, think about that. How are you not going to, like, if you stay with it, by the time you're at 20, you know, you've somewhat matured in comparison to you at 16, 17, and 18. Yes. Right? So now you've also played the game for another four years. You're a man. That's what I mean. And you understand all the bumps and bruises that go with the game. So you learn how to adjust you according to what's going on. Playing university hockey, too, is not like going to university like you're out of high school at 18 years old. University hockey, you're usually going a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Once you a couple years after after you're done um, high school. So by the time you start university hockey, you're probably 19, 20 years old. Anyway. And then you have your four years or five years of university. So you're playing until you're 25. Yeah. Like, let me tell you, do it. That's the thing. (laughs) You could play your four years in junior and hopefully get a get a scholarship to like university hockey. But if that doesn't work out, then you're sitting around with nothing at that point. So, I mean, you might as well use your hockey. Go to school. <laughs> That's I, I, after doing that trip, I'd be happy to be the water boy for BU or Harvard. Wow. Like, just the Cabin. nicest establishments. The nicest. Like, I don't know how anyone else can get access to what we got access to. But if you ever have the opportunity to go on the campus or just look around, just do it. It, it was just incredible. I couldn't imagine going a lot in, of it in NHL. Compa- like you put it in comparison to to like what we have here, right? And it's almost not fair to because even when while we were driving, you've seen the University of this South, University of the same thing North, but mm-hmm. like there's probably what like a million universities or NCAA schools in that, that area, like, in like colleges and shit like that that have hockey teams and yeah. like it's ridiculous. But these are like the top class. I've, obviously, everybody knows Harvard and BU, BU's like their walls were covered in NHL alumni. Like they're uh, running out yeah, of space. Yeah, I found that pretty uh, ironic. Right beside their sled track, they had like where you sled where you, track. The sled, sled track. Remember they had the turf, uh, the turf sled. Like you where drag you it. Throw the, oh yes, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Right beside it, they had Ryan Whitney's photo. Yeah, and <laughs> apparently that guy has no legs. So <laughs> I just found that pretty ironic. They probably <laughs> put it there strategically. <laughs> Why do you think the local ones by ping pong? I guarantee you, he's unreal at ping pong. Did we find out who that guy was in there working out? The guy with the said he had skinny legs. Did we get a name on no, that guy? No, I don't think so. Well, so get, hopefully Bowers listens. He can hit us up with the name. So we're in the room. Uh, the, we're in the BU gym, and there's one player in there. Working working out and <laughs> essentially you know what how's it doing boys nice to meet you I'm blah, blah, blah. i forget his name and he's wearing like these tight spandex and he's got ski got chicken legs he has very skinny legs and he goes all right boys nice to meet you i gotta get back i got uh, i got skinny legs i gotta make them bigger <laughs> and he's just, just in the gym just doing squats just yeah. fucking trying to get it bigger at the same time he was the only one there i don't know whether it was an injury or not yeah, but true. like what you know like he could have easily not been working out yeah that's true which would have been my route for sure Imagine if you had your own private gym. You'd go work out every day. I would just use the hot tub. How nice was that hot tub? I want to go in it. I want to take a shower. Did you see the shower? You needed a shower at that point. Oh, yeah, I stunk. <laughs> I don't blame you. I did. Um, I want to talk about Cape Breton. Mm-hmm. He played in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League for the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles. What was uh, what was the first game in the queue like? Uh, so I got called up my 17 year old year uh, just before Christmas. From Yarmouth. From Yarmouth. It's a great uh, Christmas gift. Actually, I was pretty choked because I was supposed to have a couple weeks off at Christmas, and that, <laughs> that shortened it. And uh, but tough uh, life. Yeah, the reason why I was choked because uh, got the call. It was like a Wednesday. We played Friday. They go, Yeah, do you want to come up to Cape Breton and play against uh, St. John Sea Dogs? I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> they had Jonathan Huberdo. They had Yurko Gal. Yeah, like they were stacked that year. I remember going out and I played against their. Th- third line and it was like Steve McCauley Brad T. Uh, T. Sink like I was just like these <laughs> did guys, they win the Mem Cup that year yeah, yeah and these guys played like these guys were drafted the NHL and I was 
literally just taking gear bags off the junior a bus like an hour and a half ago like this is this is crazy and, <laughs> an hour but, and a half ago. but it was but then the uh so that was a friday night and then the saturday um the saturday was pretty cool because we played against the mooseheads in cape breton cool and um during uh, Sawyer Hanna's time with the Mooseheads, he, he lived with me, so, like, he was... Oh, uh, sick. So, it was pretty cool playing against him and, like, uh, Brent Andrews and Darcy Ashley and, like, Steve Gillard and those guys, because they would always come over uh, just for, like, lunch and stuff after uh, after school or just come over, play video games, that kind of stuff. So, cool. it was uh, it was pretty cool to actually uh, get out on the ice and, and play against them, because... Were they chirping you? Uh, oh, yeah, for sure, <laughs> yeah. Not, uh, not, me so lunch. Much, not so much that game, just because they, they could probably tell just by the look on my face that I was nervous just being uh, just being out there, but uh, the next year when I actually played full time, uh, they started giving it to me a little bit more, getting uh, getting into it. But uh, so, how long is the drive from Yarmouth to Cape Breton? Uh, be about like good question eight hours. So you're you got Did they fly you? No, gosh no. You got now you get the call to go to the queue, which is like ultimately the dream. Yeah, and now you're you're like fuck, man, I'm in Yarmouth, so it's not even like you know, a couple hours, you got the jitters. It's a full eight hour day that you're sitting there like, like you're, you know what I mean? I can imagine your hands were probably sweating. You um, know what I mean? Just nervous as hell. Dude, right? I, I, remember, I remember getting the call at lunchtime and like I was in high school in Yarmouth at the time. So I remember getting the call and I was going to subway or something and got a call and he was like, yeah, do you want to come up and play? I was like, uh, all right. Like, yeah. He was like, all right, uh, well, I'm going to need you up here tomorrow by, by about one. We have practice at two. All right. I'll be, I'll leave now. I was like, Did you have a car. I didn't have a car. So that was immediate panic. I was just like, Oh, like, what am I going to do? Like, how, how is this going to work kind of thing? So, uh, one of the guys on the team drove me up here to Halifax, um, that day. So I got Who here. Who was it? Showed him out. Uh, honestly, I don't even remember. Shit. Yeah. Anyway, that whole day was such a blur. I'm lucky I even remember that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so I got to Halifax, I actually stayed the night in Halifax and then got up in the morning and uh, drove up with my parents because they were obviously they weren't missing, uh, yeah. missing my first game in the queue. Jamie? Considering uh, I was playing high school hockey about 16 months before that. But so. 36 hours before that. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Do you, do you how many shifts did you play in your first game? Do you know? Actually, it was probably more than the average game I seen after that, because they were uh, they were down a few bodies. So I don't. You must been dash three or something like that, were you? Plus two after the weekend. Plus two. No, that's why coach was like, all right, get him off. Yeah. He's plus two. Yeah. Keep him there. No. <laughs> you but, fought though. You fought one of your buddies. Yeah, I fought Hoyles. That was a uh, that was a good laugh. Actually, that same game, uh, one of the guys that played uh, midget with uh, with Hoyles and I, Cole yeah. Murphy, he got in a fight with one of Hoyles' teammates and dislocated his shoulder. So he was in the middle of the fight throwing, felt looking pretty good. And then all of a sudden, you just see him drop to one like one side, but he didn't drop to, like his he didn't drop to his knees. He stayed on his feet and just kind of leaned over. Yeah. And the guy on Blainville just added absolutely started feeding him <laughs> and his arm was out of place like his shoulder oh, was out of place that must be the worst oh, feeling. oh i man. remember just looking at him i was like i do not wish that on anyone i do and not want to fight now no so he was he was done for the game and <coughs> and then later on in the game i remember um one of our 16 year olds got uh, got kind of greased and our coach was like well someone go out there and do something next guy to touch him you better have your gloves off kind of thing and hoyles as as hoyles plays hard nose hockey stepped up on him and so i Went up to him and it was funny because we joked about it beforehand and Hoyles and I just fighting. But Not everybody does or everybody else. Everyone, men, everyone, so. but like we were joking about it, but then like obviously he fought some pretty heavies and I didn't have a fight in the queue. We had a couple in junior A, but nothing to, nothing yeah. to be proud of. So <laughs> I, uh, so then that happened and I was like, you know what? I scored the week before. It was my only goal in the queue. So I was like, you know what? I'm feeling good. Maybe this will get me that, that bump I need. And so I dropped the gloves. Guys gave me a tap on the ass, and then I sat on the bench the next day in Drummondville for about 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing, man. When you sit for that long, and then they finally give you the tap, like, I know when I played yeah, do you know Waterman, how hard it is it's to so hard to get out there and play. Like, I sat pretty much, like, almost a full game one time with Bridgewater in the Bridgewater Arena, cold-ass arena. And there's, like, three minutes left in the third period, and he gives me the tap, and I'm like what do you expect me to do, dude? Like I did my warm up. I played, didn't play a shift. So after warm up, my sweat just settled on, like I'm freezing. I don't know. You I never had, that, I never had that problem. I don't know. You should have. <laughs> yeah. If you played in an organization other than the Marauders or the Lions or the Sea Lions or whatever the hell you I played with. Double shift in my yeah. whole career. 
I remember actually when I was with the Moose for a bit, I sat for a good amount of my first game in the Metro Center. Yeah, buddy. Welcome like to the a Big A good leagues. amount. It was me and Warner. <laughs> Warner was with me, too. We just sat there in the middle. You guys actually showed up to the game and brought like a big Warner sign. I'm no, pretty he, sure. he fought that game then. Did he? It was yeah, the Nova Scotia game. Yeah, it was the Nova Scotia we, game. Uh, I'll paint the picture because it's a way better story than you made it sound. We I found had, out that he was playing because he was playing. I don't know if you did. You didn't because it was right beside the bench. <laughs> we, sat, we, <laughs> we sat right behind you. So anyways, a bunch of us, I think if I'm going to try and remember, it was myself, Cameron, Wig, Nosy, um, Bolin, Brendan Wright, and Ramey, I think. I think, yeah. And so we got absolutely bombed because we found out that Warren's was going to play with the Mooseheads because he was with Bridgewater at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. And Warren was a big Moosehead guy around town, you know, big bad Moosehead guy. So finally he was getting his sniff. So we were like, whatever, fuck it. Let's go get shit faced and we'll go to the game and we'll cheer him on, right? He's got to fight. That's what he does. So we got, wait at the first period. And then we went downstairs because he didn't play the first period. Then we went downstairs and we brought paint with us. And we all stripped our, sh- our unis off down in the like concourse of the Metro Center. Yeah. And we're painting Warns on each other's bodies. So yeah. it was Warns, 9-8. But we had an extra guy. So we, we put an exclamation point on him just so he could be included. Yeah. So it didn't even matter. Even if he stood up on the bench, we were like, ah! We were standing up screaming, but we were bombed, man. There was paint everywhere. He was probably just screaming at everyone skating on the ice. Yeah, and I then remember he fought, it was. Yeah. And we were like, we were chanting, we want Warner. But the main point of the story was downstairs was wrecked from paint. Because <laughs> we were Poor we were annihilated, story. right? But no, that was a cool moment. But I didn't know you were in the game. Yeah, I was playing the game. I, I probably hated your first you, right? game. It was my first game at the Metro Center. <laughs> Which is all I really cared about. Well, so I was there for you, man. There you go. Yeah, the, well, not you didn't have the right paint on, though. You didn't have the belly. You had warns. Well, I had warns on my belly. I should so. have said HB. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like, I remember being in the dressing room before the game, and uh, who were we playing against? It actually was against, it was Cape, against Breton. Cape Breton. Yeah. Rigus was playing on the other team, and Sab. Rigus? Rigus was on the team. Rigus played in that game. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it was like a, it was kind of like a Halifax Hawks reunion type thing. It, was, Sab it sounds was there. like it might have been the Timbits Jamboree to me. I remember Sab was there. And we saw him warming up before the game, and he had flip flops on. He's like, "I forgot my shoes back home," or something like that. I forget if that was <laughs> if it was him or not. But I remember in the dressing room before Warner just had that look in his face. And do you want to hear a good Warren's in the dressing room story? Just give me after this yeah. one. I remember everyone just looking at him, just being like, "So who are you fighting with?" He goes, "I don't know. I knew anyone that'll take me. I guess." Like you could just tell. <laughs> You know when someone's about to fight and yeah. they're not like yeah. human, they're just kind of. <laughs> yeah. He was like that. He's like I don't know. He, he gets whoever, a look. Whoever's uh, gonna take me, I guess. You know. <laughs> yeah, he gets. Uh, he gets a. Uh, let's just say a twinkle in his eye. He, just, right. he knows that he's ready to fight. So I got a, I got a good Warnsy story here. So Warnsy got traded to Yarmouth his twenty-year-old year, which would have been my nineteen-year-old year at the deadline. Night Tommy. So trick. we were. We had a pretty, like, we had a solid team. We were, we were making a run for it. We got Warrens. We got our buddy Justin Rasmussen, who um, played in the O and then played uh, with Summerside the year before when they hosted the RBC. With Warrens. With Warrens as well. So, like, th- there was our experience. There was our grit. There was, there was some skill there, too. So, we were, we were gearing up. And the funny thing was, is Warrens was actually trying to get me to go to Dieppe where he was playing at the time. So we were trying to work a trade for me to go to Dieppe from Yarmouth because I was, I don't know, things just weren't working. I needed a little change. Next thing you know, Warrens calls me. He goes, dude, I'm coming. I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, Raz and I just got traded to Yarmouth. We're on our way. I was like, oh my God, here we go. Like I got my boy coming. Like this is going to be sweet. So first game they show up playing against Dieppe, the team they just got traded from. Was Wig on the team? Sorry? Was Wig on the team? No, this was like two years after Sorry, man. So then, um, so they show up first game. We play their, uh, play their old team. Good game. Everything's working out. We play the next night against Miramichi. Miramichi, solid team. You know Miramichi. They're always tough, gritty, skilled. Just don't want, don't like playing against them. So Warrens goes out, penalty kill guy, getting in the lanes, all this kind of stuff. Blocks a shot in the mouth. We were like... First game? This was the second game with uh, the team after the trade deadline. Blocks a shot in the mouth. This was probably the second period. Oh, fuck. I know the story. Goes, in, goes into the dressing room, and he's sitting at the end of the dressing room. You walk into Yarmouth's dressing room. It's just a long, straight tube. It looks like a Centennial Arena dressing room, but with stalls. And we... Uh, so, Warren's is sitting directly ahead, and our trainer's walking in the dressing room. And he starts wiggling his two front teeth. And there's blood pretty much everywhere and our trainer comes in she goes don't do it don't touch it don't do anything he goes but they're loose and he jiggles Ah. them a little bit pulls them out 
Both teeth. <laughs> two of his bottom teeth. Pulls them out, and they're still together. Like, they're, like, completely right from the root. It was it was absolutely insane. Everyone in the dressing room Warren's going nuts. sick fuck. Like, we were just like, like, the guys that didn't know Warren's, I knew Warren's. I was just like, oh, yeah, Warren's. He does these that guys, in the living room. <laughs> these guys are like, what? is this guy doing right now like this is crazy this guy just pulled out his teeth so we go back out and close game like real close game <laughs> anyway we score with like probably four or five seconds left to win like crowd goes nuts 1500 in yarmouth on their feet so to five seconds left in the game anyway drop the puck sc- like scrum happens line brawl Warren jumps the bench after pulling his teeth out <laughs> just grabs the biggest guy on the ice and just starts throwing haymakers doesn't care whatsoever well, what's he got to lose now so are gone second game in Yarmouth jumps the bench suspended for eight we have 10 games left in our season uh, 20 his 20 year old year he missed eight of his last 10 games because he jumped the bench and pulled his teeth out prior to that Thank you for that. Thank you, Warren, for giving me a memorable junior, junior wow. story. Like, that's, like, some of that stuff you just can't, like, you wouldn't guess. You'd think a guy missing teeth, oh, yeah, he's done now hockey. He's going out and no. grabbing the biggest guy. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's and that just, just shows, that's like, mentality. guys' heart. Yeah, it just shows guys' heart. And those are the guys that you want to go to war for. Those are the guys that you're going to battle for. And, and as much as, like, Warren was, like, a... Uh, like a lot to handle back things. You got to think what he was going through. Like you said, you guys both said he had that twinkle in his eye or whatever. Cause he, he had to get in that mindset, but he was the guy that I honestly probably, I wouldn't say respected the most, but I had so much respect for him. Whereas I played on his line, but you want to go to war with that guy. If you look over and that guy's pulling his teeth out and then someone touches one of your teammates and he sacrifices literally his entire rest of his career to protect you with his teeth already gone. Are you not going to want that guy in your team? Do you know what I mean? Like you look to him and you go, keep him. He, that, that motherfucker is insane. You know what I mean? Just pulled his teeth out, then fought for us. He's still bleeding. Do you want the guy who doesn't want the puck or doesn't get the puck out on the wall in the D zone or the guy that's blocking shots with his face? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to go with the guy blocking shots with his exactly, face. Like it's right? just, it's just the way it is. I mean, he came with a lot of like crazy stuff off the ice too, right? He was like 16 as a, as a heavyweight. Yeah. It's probably not easy on you. You don't, no. I didn't see it back then. Right. But yeah. Yeah, and it's no excuse for Warren being an idiot, you idiot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. It is a great story. Just pulls his fucking teeth out. That goes Before out. we shut her down, um, you got some Jimbo. Do you have any cool Jimbo stories? Oh, because sorry. Everybody has. <laughs> Before we get to Jimbo stories, should we shout out Jill's uh, game? Oh yeah, okay. Do you yeah. want to do that? For sure. um, Me too. So Jill Sonye, if you don't know who she is, you probably shouldn't be listening, anyways. Just here's the info if you want to. Look um, it. she's having a charity game March 16th at the BMO Center in. All proceeds will be going to the Barho family. If you don't know the Barho family, I suggest you look into it. Um, it's say who they are. They're the, they're the family that the the seven children passed away in the fire. Yeah, I did, just didn't really go there. Okay. But anyways, it's at the BMO Center. It's on Saturday, March 16th. Um, there's a silent auction, so if you have any items available, she is, uh, she is always looking for those. Um, so, yeah, it's essentially a charity game. There's going to be a meet and greet, uh, a, kid, a kid's game. A silent auction and just an open skate for everybody to go. Proceeds will be taken at the door. It's a great event. She's working really hard behind the scenes while she's um, while she's playing right now during the season. So if you guys can make it by then, it is March 16th at the BMO Center in Bedford. All right, let's go Jimbo stories. Give me give me your best Jimbo. All right, uh, I'm pretty sure I played on uh, the last team Jimbo ever uh, coached. Oh, he doesn't coach anymore. Yeah, he owns Liverpool. He owns Liverpool Junior. Where Warren's coaching. I'm pretty sure (laughs) the last team that he coached was Yarmouth when I was there my 20 year old year, and so probably the best Jimbo story I have. We were we were an older team. We probably had one guy under 18. So we like Jimbo tends to have an older team, likes to have the the toughness on the team. So we brought in a few guys from Quebec, brought in a few guys from Ontario, and he needed the boys to to get to know each other. So uh, took the bar uh, the boys to the uh, Red Knight, which is the bar in Yarmouth. He's known uh, for doing showed these out, uh, went there once or twice in uh, in my day, That's a nice. couple of vodka <laughs> limes. But uh, the boys uh, the boys went in the back room. They have like a little pool hall in the back room. So yeah. Jimbo was like, "All right, we'll have uh, we'll have a little team night." Opened up uh, opened up the bar, had a few drinks and Talk a couple of drinks flowing. And uh, one of the guys on our team, uh, Pooley, showed out Pooley. He uh, French guy didn't know much English, but uh, he got across to Jimbo that uh, if he beat Jimbo in a game of pool, that he was allowed to drive his Mariners like. Uh, SUV that, uh, that we had for <laughs> the team. What a great deal. So 
They uh, they agreed on the deal. They uh, Jimbo and him went uh, toe to toe, came down to the last shot, and uh, Pooley absolutely sunk it. The bar. <laughs> we were going nuts. This was like a. It was weird. It was like a Tuesday or a Wednesday night, and we were just having That's fun. And we were going nuts. It was like a, it was like one of the boys won the lottery. That's like we awesome. were, It was like we won the championship. Boys were going nuts. We were we were chanting Jimbo, Jimbo, Jimbo during the whole thing. Like it was it was hilarious. The last but, time you heard that was during the old exports days, probably. Oh man, I remember like that guy took more verbal abuse at away arenas than and oh, gave, yeah. but gave, but gave it right back. Yeah, oh, yeah like man. When, let's not be blindfolded here. Mike. No, no, it's definitely not a one way street. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. I remember he was coaching in Amherst once, and he was on the bench during warm ups, and I'm just there warming up, not really thinking much, and I just hear him yelling at me, "Hey, Belly, hey, Belage, <laughs> we're coming for you." Yeah. Belly like, shitting himself. I'm just like. I'm just trying to warm up here, man. Yeah. What are you talking about? Stop patrolling the red We're line. We're coming for you. Yeah, oh yeah. I'm in the corner. I'm not anywhere near the red line. The yeah. fact that I could hear him from the corner, that yeah. says how loud he was yelling. Yeah, no, but he was, honestly, I, I loved having him as a coach. Just, honestly, just on the fact that he was one of those guys that, he let you do your thing. If, as long as you were playing well, if you if you weren't playing well, you you heard it. That like plain and simple, he told you straight up. It, whether it was in front of the team or in the office or in front of your family, one on one, like he he was telling you straight up. And that and I can respect that because I had coaches in my career that they would tell you one thing behind like to your face, and then behind the back you'd. Like you just wouldn't know what you were getting out of them, and I and that's one thing that I try to take with me in coaching now is say that like keep it honest. Like yeah. it's the it's the best policy, well, how especially are they with know kids. If you don't tell them. And when we're when we're junior age kids, you're eighteen, nineteen, twenty. You're looking to go to that next level. You need to you need to have that honesty because if a coach isn't going to go to bat for you or go to war for you when you're calling around to get a university offer, yeah. then you, then you're screwed because you're only as good as the word that yeah. he that was you the have. opposite for me. Yeah. Correct. All right, boys, let's wrap it up here. We're on an hour. Um, last couple minutes of yours, if you want to say hi to anyone, family, friends, team, uh, it's your your little minute here. Shout yeah, I just want to uh, shout out the uh, Dartmouth Moosehead Dry, the ball boys. Uh, Come, baby. Yeah, we're going to be uh, going to nationals here in, uh, in the summer, going to Chatham, hopefully uh, bring home some hardware. Uh, also, just want to thank my uh, my family for everything they've done through my hockey career. I mean, I couldn't have done it uh, without them. It's mm. uh, it was a long journey. Talked a lot about uh, a lot Hard about journey. my hockey, and I uh, wouldn't have been able to uh, get there without the the sacrifices that they made for me. So I just wanted to uh, say thanks to them. All right, unreal, Billy. Thanks for coming yeah, on, man. Appreciate it. Um, everyone listening, make sure to go to all of our social media outlets: like, subscribe, comment, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, SoundCloud. And that's it. March 16th, BMO Center. All right, we're out. Peace.